We're now streaming live on YouTube, Chairman. Thank you very much, Joanne. And I'll say good afternoon and welcome um, members and any members of the public that happen to be um, listening in or logging in. Um, welcome to today's meeting of the Planning Policy Committee. Um, apologies, we're a few, little, um, a few minutes late um, as, starting as I was having grappling with IT issues. Um, but we'll move on to item one of today's... Actually, one thing I will just pick up um, is obviously in appreciation of the sad news in respect to the Duke of Edinburgh. And this is, I think, the first meeting um, of a committee of East Lindsay since that news. Um, I don't intend to hold a minute silence of this committee, as I understand the council will do that when it meets in full council next. Um, and there are national arrangements in place for Friday. So um, I don't mean to be um, disrespectful, but I think it's, I think um, that will be marked in other ways, in better ways than um, addressing that in, in, in this particular committee, if members are, co are comfortable with that. Thank you. Um, so we'll press on with item one, which is the record of attendance, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, for the benefit of the recording, I'll just call members' names out. If you could just confirm whether you're present, please. Um, Councillor Ashton. I'm present. Councillor Jimmy Brooks is an apology. Councillor Dennis. Present. Councillor Dickinson. Present. Councillor Grover is um, absent at the moment. Councillor Howard. Yes, present. Thank you. Councillor Kemp is an apology. Councillor McMillan is absent. Councillor McNally is an apology. Councillor Matthews. Present. Thank you. And Councillor Smith. Councillor Smith. Present. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. That concludes the roll call for the record of attendance. Thank you very much, Elaine. Um, item two is disclosures of interest. If anyone has any, um, please use the raise hand facility to indicate. Seeing no one, if anything comes up, um, by all means, flag it in the meeting. Um, item three is the minutes of the meeting held uh, 28th of January. I'm happy to take those as read. Um, does anyone have anything they wish to address in respect of the minutes? Seeing no hands up, um, I'm happy to, um, if, if, assuming there's no dissent, um, to approve those and um, consent to signing them electronically in, in some form when we're able to. Um, we have a proposer and seconder, please, Chairman. Happy to propose from the Chair, Councillor Touches. Smith. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I say, any, if, if there's anyone wishing to dissent, seeing no one, we will, we, we will count those as approved. Um, item four is actions of um, from the previous meeting. Um, is there anything anyone would like to pick up there on um, page 11 to 12? Could I say, Chairman, please, if I, if I may, they are all in hand. Um, I just don't know whether Simon might have an update on the ones that are marked as outstanding on page 12. Um, I suspect not, but I, I know that they are in hand at this moment. Sorry, apologies. I haven't actually got the, um, the full agenda open. Can you just let me know which, um, which one's Page 11. On? Sorry, my, uh, my internet had been playing up, so I hadn't actually opened up the front uh, sheet. Just bear with me a moment. I'm not sure, uh, Councillor Ashton, whether you may be able to provide an update on action number 21 on page 12. Uh, 
I don't have any update at the moment. Um, okay. That, that's fine. I mean, they're really more for Mike. Um, what I'll do is I'll make sure between Simon and I will chase him up and make sure that there is a um, final response in there or certainly an update for the next meeting. Yeah, the, the updates that I can see in there in red, nothing to add to them. Um, no, nothing, nothing to add to them. I think I think the, the red updates explain um, the position of those. Which which other one did you mention? Sorry. It was minutes number 21 and 22 from the meeting on the 29th of October. And then the bottom one about the Skegness Gateway. But I think that's maybe for, you, you know, something for the future that is just marked as hands at the moment. Yeah, I think I think in reverse, um, the Skegness Gateway is one that Mike really needs to to give an update on. Um, yeah. We're not particularly involved with that project, um, certainly at this stage. I mean, I'm I'm happy to update on 21A in so far as there is the decided political will to address that and consensus among among colleagues that it will be done as a matter of priority. Um, it. There is, however, a question of resource and staffing, um, which we 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 will have to work through in order to make it happen. But it is going to happen. I will say that, um, knowing the view of exec colleagues as well, um, that it 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 isn't something that um, we can afford not to address any longer. Chair, if I may, on the very final item, the Skegness Gateway, I think for non-Skegness members, it, it is vital that we um, you know, get fully briefed on, on what's going on there. Um, we don't want to be at odds with our Skegness colleagues. Um, we need to be fully aware of what's going on. I couldn't agree more, um, Councillor Howard. We... As I say, I, I fully expect that the, um, the Skegness Gateway will come to a future meeting, but Mike isn't here to say exactly which one. Um, he, he can em he'll envisage that being, but I hope to be very soon. Yeah, yeah, sooner rather than later, I think, because the, the, the whole um, Townsfund um, issues and, and whatever you're moving forward, uh, you know, out of pace and we need to keep up. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Chair, Chairman, just in terms of the second uh, bullet point, if you like, um, for 21, yeah, that, that's in hand at the moment. We haven't, we haven't actually uh, managed to get that finished yet, but that's, that's in hand. Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to move on to item five, which is the strategic housing uh, market assessment. And I think that one, Simon is taking us through that report. Am I right? Uh, no, this one's actually Kay that's, um, that's, that's kindly written the report and we'll take members through it. Welcome, Kay, and thank you very much. That's quite all right. Right, the uh, last strategic housing market assessment was produced um, in 2016 as part of the evidence base for the local plan. But there have been quite a few changes to national policy since that was prepared. Um, the MPPF doesn't actually formally require Ishmar is prepared anymore, but it does require that our policies are based on up-to-date evidence. And Ishmar is seen as quite a good way of, uh, still a good way of presenting that evidence. So we have commissioned an update um, of our existing Ishmar from Opinion Research Services to give us um, a more up-to-date evidence base for the local plan moving forward. In particular, the housing figure that's in the current local plan doesn't use government standard methodology, which is now a requirement. And so without this calculation, the plan would not be considered sound at examination in the future. So it's quite important that that piece of work was carried out. The report starts with looking at how the district functions as a housing market. It goes on to then look at the nature of that housing market, it looks at demographic projections for the district, then the role of housing in job creation, um, affordable housing and then just a calculation for the local housing need figure using the standard methodology. Um, the report has concluded that although there is cross-boundary movement with neighbouring districts, which we're all very aware of, 
Uh, East Lindsay is predominantly one housing market, which is important information for us in terms of the duty to cooperate with our neighbouring districts. Um, on the section on the housing market, it's identified that although house prices are slightly lower in East Lindsay than the national average, the housing market has generally followed the trends that have happened nationally. So we're sort of in step with everybody else. There's nothing anomalous there. Demographic projections have um, been included to look at the makeup of the households in the district moving forward, which is interesting and useful information for us. The headlines coming out of that are that single person households are likely to make up over 60% of household growth in the future. Families with dependent children will make up a third of household growth and that the number of couples without children are projected to fall, but there will be an increase in the, the over 65 category. Um, the section on the housing market and the future job creation has concluded that the housing target that we'll come to later on in the report will be sufficient to meet the additional demands generated by likely job creation, which is, which is very good. Um, the assessment on affordable housing um, looks at the gap between house prices and incomes and the ability of people to access both rental and houses to buy. It has identified a particularly large figure for affordable housing of 492 per annum, but that is a raw data figure. And the report then goes on to do quite a lot of work analysing this in more detail and looking at how much of that theoretical demand would actually transfer into housing delivery. And the figure has been revised down to 221 per annum. But this does represent 52% of our housing target. So it's still it's a large figure. I'd like to just point out at this point that there is an error in the report in the section on affordable housing, which I've have spotted and has been now corrected, but unfortunately that was after the report went to press. Um, some of the figures um, in the section are incorrect. They are a previous calculation that was carried out and the new calculation hasn't, they haven't updated the text, but the figures moving from that point forward are correct. So the 221 per annum is actually the accurate figure. Now, this figure is higher than the 2016 Schmar, but since the 2016 Schmar was prepared, the affordability ratio for the district has increased. And the government has also changed the way it defines affordable housing and put more emphasis on affordable home ownership and products to provide that. So therefore, the assessment of affordable housing need in the district has been carried out differently. And the critical and penultimate chapter of the Schmar calculates the revised housing need figure for the district. Although this was being discussed at the time the local plan went to examination, it was uh, subsequent to the adoption of the local plan that the government brought in the standard methodology for calculating the minimum local housing need figure, or as we would generally refer to it, the housing target. Um, and as the review of the local plan must use a figure based on this formula if it's to pass examination, the calculation has been carried out and the new figure for the district's housing need is 423 per annum as compared to 558 in the current local plan. The standard methodology also requires that um, a consideration is carried out of any specific groups whose needs may add to the local housing need figure and in particular relevance to East Lindsay are older people and those with a disability. But the Schmar has concluded that the housing methodology figure will provide enough um, to meet those need, people's needs. And the final check in the standard methodology is to look whether a cap needs to be introduced um, onto the local housing need figure, but that is only necessary where the new figure using the methodology significantly exceeds the current housing targets in an area. But as these things, this figure is lower than the, um, the current figure, then that's not necessary at this time. So I think there's a lot of information in the Schmar, a lot of statistical work, but the two headline figures coming out of that are really that the 221 households per annum in affordable need and the new minimum housing target and I mean, housing need figure of 423 per annum. Thank you. Thank you very much for 
Um, given that report, Kay, I think it. Um, I mean, for my for my mind, um, my question for effectively, um, are we? It's one thing to put that. It's, it's one thing for us to aspire to that kind of figure um, on affordable. Um, I am sceptical as to whether it is ever likely to be deliverable. Um, and keeping in mind questions on viability and everything else around that, um, th th I, I'd be much more alarmed if we weren't able to meet our overall housing delivery figure, um, because that's the point at which we don't, in effect, have an operable local plan. Um, but I'm happy to open it up to debate. And uh, I've got Councillor Howard first. Go. Councillor Howard, then Councillor Smith. Yeah, I, I, I know you know, we, we're probably getting into the lies, damn lies and statistics zone here um, in the grounds that we, we bandy figures around and, and, and we can justify any set of figures that we, that we want to put forward. Um, we just have to have the, the right story behind it. But I do find it, um, remarkable that we that we can initially get a, a, a figure of 492 for the affordable housing and it reduces to 221. Now, now that's not a tweak, that's a ginormous slicing of it. Um, and I would therefore say, actually, is this calculation correct? Just purely on the fact that the two figures vary immensely and as I say we can pick our story we can justify it in any way shape or form um, but I also look at the way that the uptake of uh, locally the the Gulf Road um, housing was instant a lot of people said there was no call for that particular development and some said certainly no call for affordable housing within it. Uh, the, the affordable housing was brought up front and the demand was there uh, and it was taken up immediately. So as I say, I'm, I'm more inclined to believe that a figure of 492 would be correct than a figure of 221. Just, you know, if, if 492 has been thrown up by one calculation and the evidence I see is that there is definitely a demand and a, and a very real demand, um, then how could we justify working it down from 492 to 221? And in the face of that, you know, that, that evidence that, that I've seen. Uh, and, but as I say, it, it is always a case with these figures of, you know, you can make a justification for any set of figures you, you want to put out. You could have probably, um, found a reason for reducing it to three. Um, if you, you know, if, if you um, work hard enough, you know, to make something sound plausible. I, I do just um, worry that um, we are, that there's such a disparity. And I, I, I just worry that we will um, not stand up to scrutiny. Thank you. Hey, is there any, could you possibly explain some of the methodology of, of, of how that how that works through, please? Yeah, obviously I didn't write the Schmar, so and I'm not a statistician, but um, I know part of the reason for the the, the change is that the initial calculation that they the, there is required to be carried out the way the government sets it out, it has to include um, people who aspire to home ownership but can't afford market home ownership to make up that affordable need as I, as I say the definition of what is affordable housing has now changed and that's that's a, a laudable aspiration but not everybody will have the means to be able to afford even the affordable housing market products and so there's been some um, calculations carried out based on income levels and what percentage of people it's felt aspire to buy a house um, and will use affordable products and those that can actually afford them rather than affordable rent. So that 
that is part of the reason why the figures have come from quite a very broad definition of what affordable need would be down to a, a narrower definition. So I've, of, of what I hear of um, sales that are going on in the area, um, I don't hear of many new people coming into the market. Um, you know, I hear a lot of people are moving from property to property. So where are those people being catered for? And that's why, you know, if they're not coming into the market, then surely they will make a demand on the um, affordable and uh, housing association uh, areas. But um, I say it's, it's all gut feeling. Um, and I know you have to do these calculations in in, in set ways, but it it, it just it, it just doesn't sit right with me. And uh, I, I say I, that's it's not a casting any aspersions your way, Kay, on the on the the quality of the work you've done. Um, you know your rules and regulations that you're working with. I just think that at the end of the day, we've not necessarily got the right result that will stand up to scrutiny um, with what's actually happening in the real world. And I'll leave it at that. I think for me the difficulty would be if we went with a higher figure um, when we're looking at 52.67% um, um, of our identified housing need as being um, households in need of affordable housing, either to rent or to buy. Um, if we went with a higher um, figure that, that, that we're talking about there, um, everything that we would be building would have to be affordable in order to meet that, 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 that higher figure. And I don't know, I, I, and I genuinely um, uh, struggle to understand what, the extent to which we are going to be able to deliver. If, if one thing identifying a need, it's another being able to deliver to meet that need with the tools that we have available to us. Yeah, and certainly we've, we've, we've got the aspiration locally that we're trying to um, bring in quality jobs and well-paid jobs, professional jobs. Which has always been seen as a lack, and that would would bring new people into the housing market. But currently, we're not there. So surely, again, that says the demand for um, social house, uh, affordable housing, would still be there. Um, I say, I can't prove it. It's a good feeling. Thank you, Simon. Would you like to come in? Yeah, <clears throat> only briefly to say, um, uh, Council Howe, there's, there's, there's a more in-depth, I know it's a, it's a weighty report, 84 pages, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a more in-depth um, discussion and explanation about how the affordable housing figures have been arrived at in section uh, 7.5, which is on page 53, um, um, and, and then a few sections continuing from that, and it does explain uh, how, they've, how they've arrived at the, at the reduced figure in there, um, and, and it, it is it is along the lines of, of, of what Kay said. Well, it's, it's what Kay said um, in terms of having to to look at in, in a realistic scenario um, how many people are actually going to be in the market for a house, not aspiring, not not a dream in fifty years time, but but realistically, what what figure um, and what what number of people are, are, are going to be looking for a house um, and an affordable house? Um, I mean, you'll see when we go into the EVA that. Um, the delivery of affordable housing is something else that will need to be discussed um, and how we secure that. Um, and certainly the, the, the 221, I think, was it, Kay, um, that, that's proposed uh, in, in terms of a need um, per annum is, is already above, quite significantly above what we deliver on an annual basis at the moment anyway um, in the current local plan. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I mean, I'd say uh, rather than going through all of that section, Councillor Howard, um, yeah, it, it, it does go into it in a little bit more detail and explain the situation. But I, I think the important thing to stress for this report and for the economic viability assessment, these are these are baseline figures. These are a starting point. This is one piece of evidence that goes into the mix when we're looking at our overall housing strategy for for the next 15, 20 years across the district. Um, we, we have to we have to get some evidence. We have to get a starting point, And then it's down for. Down, down to the members of the committee, the council, to, to, to work out how we're going to try and um, address any issues that are there, the delivery, um, and how that fits into the overall um, strategy, um, housing strategy. That's, that's all I, I just wanted to mention. 
Thank you, Simon. Councillor Smith and Councillor Matthews, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think Tony's point rests on the fact that these are ever shiftable goalposts in that, you know, the number of people who can afford affordable housing depends on how affordable you make it. Um, so, uh, you know, it's the government cutting their coat according to their cloth or their desires, I suppose. The thing I want, um, there's a couple of things I wanted to ask. Um, one was around these figures on uh, affordable housing and how that might be impacted on when the um, the report itself was actually written and the assessment was actually done. Um, was this done pre-COVID? Um, is there any uh, implications for you know the general economic upheaval that has occurred since then and the number of people who may be able to affect you know afford lesser uh, pricey homes etc um is that even something that, that is possible to to figure into this as we move forward because this is gonna you know the, the post-covid economy is is entirely what what this is about um and the other thing I wanted to ask was, you sort of talked about the the, the one housing market um, for ELDC, um, and I wondered if, um, as we're looking at the period to 2040 here, whether or not the increasing uh, reduction in available land space due to potential sea level rise um, in the coming years is going to significantly impact on our immediate neighbours and our immediate districts. Um, we're almost unique in Lincolnshire and Cambridgeshire uh, with regards to the extent to which people are going to move or have to move from one district to another. And I wondered if that had been taken into consideration even at all, because it's something which, while we can't really control, we should have a bit of an estimate on, on how that might impact our uh, our arrangements. I mean, I'm, I, I, I can answer in, 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 in part on that, that it is simply uh, with the Environment Agency has given a, a commitment to defending the current line of the coast for the next three epochs, which takes us into the beginning of the uh, 22nd century houses that are either there or, or, or hypothetically might be built um, have to be safe for their lifetime and that's reasonably taken at the moment to be a be hundred years and even if there was to be a change in the environment agency's policy on where the coast should be after a period which is still a good hundred years away from now I think they would. These are far bigger questions um, than we can address in setting planning policy um, here and now in East Lindsay. And I hope, and I'm optimistic that actually doing anything different than holding the line on the current on on, on the current line of the coast will always remain as politically unpalatable in the future as what it is now because as we all know with the, the, the geography of our coast and, and interested in mentioning Cambridgeshire and the Fens is it's not a case of man, uh, sort of managed retreat um, isn't a case of, of, of here of just letting a little bit go that's difficult to defend it's wholesale realignment of what the east coast of, 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 of Britain looks like and I think at that point I, I, I'm fairly comfortable that it's not something that's going to happen in the next 100 years. And I'd be really skeptical of whether it happens after that point. Um, but that will be for decision for politicians far beyond um, our grade and, and, and a considerable distance into the future. Yeah, I, I think um, I think it, it's not necessarily a case of, of whether or not we, we maintain the coastline, it's, it's, it's drainage. Uh, and, and the, the, the resulting drainage issues and the land that can be built on in those areas as a result and habited as a result. Um, you know, it's, it's a big job to, uh, to drain 
from land that's lower than the sea level? I, I've got, providing the Environment Agency holds the line um, on the coast, I'm fairly confident that internal drainage, effectively the drainage boards, will be able to keep ahead um, of what's falling from the sky. Um, Councillor Matthew. Um, it's just amusing, really. Just, you know, how current is this? Um, it's taken from last census. Um, and actually, we, you know, we're, it's not come from, pre, well, it's pre-COVID, isn't it? But it's not capturing the fact that COVID will have actually changed what's happening in our market. And I know Councillor Smith has, has touched on it, but that's not captured in here. And um, I'm looking at um, the migration section. Um, I know for a fact in our area, you know, houses, as soon as they're put up in the state agents, when does it go straight away? There is a trend that people want to move to the countryside to open places, open spaces. And, you know, this, because it isn't, and I know you have to work with the stats that you've got, um, but if this is going to inform what happens in the next so many years, it's really, is it just a textbook exercise? You know, is it really giving us the information we really need? I know it's a guide, um, and I know you're not going to be able to answer this, but I just think it's, <laughs> there's things that are happening now that are not going to be captured in this that are going to be affecting us in the future that we're not going to be planning for because we're working on data that is quite old. And, uh, you know, I just have some reservations about it. I know it's a really good piece of work um, and it ticks a box, but I just think, you know, things are changing. We've had population loss um, in the older generation. Um, and I think some of these things, you know, will time with what's happening in the vital and viability and how we change work and migration of people coming in. But it's just to note that, really. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Matthew. Simon, please. Um, yeah, we've, we've, we've obviously discussed COVID um, at length at, at, in other meetings and how that impacts on the validity of, of any data and work that we do at any given point in time. And it is, I, I appreciate it, it is, it is a really difficult one. Um, where We're in a position where all the noise from central government is that we need to push forwards with plans, that planning is critical to the recovery in one way, shape or form, however that may be. Um, so we're in a position where we, we, we have no choice but to carry out this kind of assessment because it is critical and does underpin the evidence base for, for our local plan and for the review of the local plan, which, which needs to be submitted imminently. It is based... It is based on the 2011 census purely because that's all we have. We've only just done the new one and it will probably be a couple of years before we ever we, we get any, any meaningful sort of process data out of that that we can use. Um, I mean, obviously, that's not the only source of data that they have used. Um, I mean, there's, there's a whole wealth of other statistical information available from central government, from the ONS, um, from other locations um, as well. Um, looking at patterns of work, patterns of movement to work. When you're looking at the housing area, it's important to look at cross-boundary movement in terms of employment trends. Um, that's one of the things they look at. Um, so absolutely, there's going to be migration in and out of the district and, and in any other district across the country. But it's looking at the patterns of, of how those people actually live and work when they actually live here um, in terms of defining a housing area. Um, all I can say again, and, and I've said it before, is that this, we, 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 this is a snapshot. This is, this is a baseline of the current position as we know it. Um, it's only just been finalised. Um, so it has been worked on all of the last year whilst we've been going through COVID. So that's very much been in the forefront of all of our minds, including, including the consultants that have carried out the work for us as well. But in the absence of any significant market data coming out yet, um, there's, there's not much we can do. There is always the option to refresh, um, you know, a light touch revisit of some of the figures if there's any new evidence that comes out um, to show how the economy has changed, how, how, how patterns of living have changed, um, whether there is evidence to show that there is a greater migration away from urban centres into the more rural locations, which anecdotally, there is some evidence to suggest. I've heard that from, from local estate agents. I mean, they're as busy as, as, as they ever have been. In terms of housing completions in this last year, in actual fact, our, our housing completions in this last 12 months are only marginally down on, on what they would have been the year before and, and still sit within the annual fluctuations 
uh, anyway. So obviously the housing market has remained relatively buoyant. That could point to the fact that people are looking more to move out into the rural rural areas. It's very difficult. It's all it's all sort of guesswork at the moment, and we and we can't base an important piece of evidence on on guesswork. We have to base certainly at this stage the baseline that we're doing. It has to be based on on statistical evidence that we have at the moment. And then with the option to maybe review it going forwards, if 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 necessary, that's that's the only assurance and the only thing I can I can sort of um, say on that. And it applies to all the work we're doing at the moment. I, I think that's great, Simon. But we have evidence we've been in a pandemic and we're still in a pandemic, and we somehow have to capture that in this report. Whether it's about you know the situation now, and and whether it's a an, the introduction where we are now at this present day. And whether there's something within there in one of the appendices that, you know, to revisit, to look at the impact, that would be a responsible thing to do and just see that how that is affecting our housing market. Um, I just I just feel that, you know, we just can't pretend, you know, it is going to affect us and it needs to be captured somehow within here. Um, we can't just pretend it didn't happen. And there, there is evidence, I think they're coming out to support it. And whether it, there could just be something in there, I just, you know, feel that quite strongly about that. I think how other people uh, feel. I, th I think what we've got is a starting point um, rather than an end point. And it seemed very familiar to, uh, you know, to, to the other background documents that. We, that we need in place when uh, as part of the building blocks of, of, of doing plan and plan review. Um, I think the far the, the far bigger challenge to my mind isn't whether we've got the figures here statistically as beautiful as they possibly could be. It's how on earth we meet the demand which is identified, given the pressures that. Um, different policy makers, be it ourselves or national government, um, continue to burden um, the housing market with. And in an area, as we're familiar with, where value, land values are already relatively low, I don't want us to end up in a position where people that are building houses for a profit, which is what house builders will always um, try to do will find it much uh, much better for them not to build in East Lindsay because we're piling expectation on expectation on expectation um, and at that point we're not delivering the overall housing numbers that we're that we are required to and at that point we no longer have a five-year forward supply of housing and that's the point at which we don't have an effective local plan and i i the, the stuff that's come that's coming through the pipeline with the environment bill and everything else it's one thing on top of another thing on top of another thing and i just think we have that's that's where i think we we're going to have to um, focus our brain power not over whether we're capturing precisely the right number in in, in this document um i mean I, I simon go for it yeah no i, I come back I'll, off to you simon okay okay thanks councillor um no i i, I agree fully uh, fully chairman um I, I think i think what's important for us is to is to actually make sure that we have a plan that's flexible enough to respond to any changes that are going to occur because of covid it's not something that we can predict um, or, or, or actually put down. No, no one's managed to do it yet. Um, there, and I, I'll go back to it. There is anecdotal evidence, but until people actually start producing um, some actual uh, serious reports and, and actual surveys, and, and we've had a bit longer to digest uh, what's happening, no, no one can really predict what, what the actual outcomes of COVID are going to be. So, so our job is to actually have a local plan that is flexible enough to, to respond to that. Um, is, is, is there going to be a mass migration from urban areas into the, into the countryside? Yes, there's some evidence of it at the moment. Is that going to be sustained once COVID potentially has, has sort of come under control and people get back into the original mindset? Are people going to drift back to the cities as well? Um, so, so we don't, we don't know that. Um, the, other, the, other, well, the other thing I will just mention as well is these, these are minimums. This is the minimum sort of target. Um, there's nothing stopping more house building occurring. If there's a market there, developers will come at the end of the day developers are in it for the money if there's a market there 
um, they, they will build it. So that, that will dictate to some extent. We need to make sure that we're providing for, for the minimum targets that we need to, to provide for and that our plan is flexible enough to then allow any additional development that, that is needed um, for the lifetime of the plan. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I mean, I, just coming back, you know, okay, I understand what you're saying, but we're working on outdated figures. So relevance, I don't, I, I don't understand that really particularly. Um, and that you, in the needs of different groups, um, I think it probably comes under there. We don't, we don't capture anything about environmentally friendly and the green issues, the green building, where we should be sort of driving things forward. Is there, is there no way within this that responding to like the housing needs assessment that that could be in there as well? Am I right in thinking that that's So sort of build stuff? your own house and things like that. Yeah, am I right in thinking, um, Simon, that we will pick up on those strands in other studies and bring them together as part of the plan review rather than trying to build them into this? Yeah, absolutely. This this is a this is effectively a statistical baseline. Um, we um, the the economic viability assessment. Okay. We're looking at, when the economic viability assessment does look at. I'll explain when I go into that. Um, different elements that do add um, add costs into the development. Um, biodiversity net gain, for example. Um, we also now have, um, as you know, a environment manager, um, climate change and environment manager, who also I believe is is, is now hired a, a, an officer as well. Um, and the idea that is that officer will actually liaise quite closely with um, the local planning team um, to make sure that, that climate change, um, carbon reduction, um, the provision of green infrastructure, to make sure that that runs through the local plan um, as well going forwards. Um, so it's certainly not something that's, that's sort of being ignored or brushed under the carpet. Um, this report is, is a statistical analysis effectively, so it's not included um, in, in that. Okay, so we don't we don't keep any records of any housing that's built in the area that is that has solar panels, that has um, heat source pumps, are we starting to build up that data? Or is this these figures so old that they won't capture that? But can we find out whether we can capture that in the future? Because that is going to inform us as well, year on year or, or report on report, whether we are actually starting to address the issues around greening our houses. The, sorry, Chairman, if I, if I just continue. Um, the the annual uh, the authority monitoring report that we do um, does pick up on um, renewable technologies. Um, the problem we have is that um, a lot of that a lot of a lot of renewable um, power generation now can be actually be done under PD, um, and you, you've got permitted development rights um, for both residential and I believe commercial properties now for installation of various different um, types of renewable energy source. The requirement for up to 31% reduction in carbon on new build properties is something that uh, is, is being consulted on. It's something that um, as the committee, I brought it um, over a year ago and a subset of members, we actually went through and, and actually did a response um, to, to that consultation. Um, that's something that my understanding is will actually be pushed through the building regulation side of things um, yeah, because no, that, no. Is, no. that is then looking at the, the very detailed technical calculations on how much carbon is the property actually producing and how much does it need to be reduced by and then what measures can be put in. Um, so very similar in building regs where you look at the, the type of lighting that goes in, you know, the type of composting toilet you put in, that kind of things, that level of detail is all done under the, under the, under the building regulation side of it. Um, what the planning side will do will be to try and facilitate that and make sure that developments um, are viable and, and, and can actually um, incorporate those types of developments. Thank you, Simon. I think it's important to recognise that this paper is a tool to estimate what our housing numbers I know, I know. are likely to be um, in the next 20 years, rather than try, trying to bring in elements that sit in in, in, in in other documentation and other studies. I mean, I, I, I fully appreciate and take on board the comments in respect to, um, of, of, of the base of, of the census being um, when it was and where we are, but in the same way as the discussions we have um, on the retail studies in previous meetings, I think we just need to accept that this is as, as good as it possibly can be, uh, but I'm sure Simon and Kay recognise that, um, you know, we, 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 this is a start point rather than an end point. 
and our plan when it's reviewed will in itself be a, 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 a very much hope a living document that is able to respond to challenges um, as they come forward. As we've seen with the current plan, the numbers that it, ex it that it says we need and the allocations that are made to meet that, any of us that represent communities which have said, well, you've got a local plan, this site, you know, an application coming in, this, this isn't in the local plan, now we've got a plan, can you stop it? Actually, probably not, if it's still in a sustainable location um, and it meets all of the other criteria. So whatever numbers we come forward with with a plan, they are the starting point rather than the end point. But in, I mean, in that breath, it is interesting to note that the overall housing figures for um, 2020 to, 20, to 2040 um, and what that works out as how many we need per year is actually slightly lower than the period we're in at the moment with the current local plan. Um, and I'd say I hope that would give a, a, a thin sliver of comfort um, to communities um, that, are, that, that feel like they've borne the brunt um, of, of development in, in, in the local plan that we've got, that actually the market looking forward might be a little bit, m might be a bit, uh, it might not be quite the demand um, for, for, for a new building that we thought that they might be, or they thought that they might be. Um, so I think there, there is a little bit of good news in there that in, in, in terms of putting a plan together and putting the, getting the plan review, we don't actually need quite as many houses overall um, from, 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 the, from allocations as what we might otherwise have done. Simon? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try and be brief because I think I've monopolized quite a lot of the talking, but um, only to just, just come at the end, uh, just, just to reiterate that the, the actual calculation is a standard methodology. It's central government that have told us how to work it out. So we have no say in that. And although there is there is a, a caveat where you can deviate from that, you have to have incredibly strong arguments and evidence to show why you're deviating from that, that national standard methodology figure. Um, just, just anecdotally, this is a revised methodology. The government produced an initial methodology probably a year ago, and the consultants worked out what our need would be based on that, and it was over 800 houses per year. Um, However, after a lot of lobbying by various people, thankfully they've revised the methodology and obviously that now has brought this figure of 423, um, I think it was per year, um, which as, as the chairman says, is, is actually below our current target and actually realistic um, and achievable um, uh, based, based on our current delivery rates at the moment. Um, so that, that was it really, that was all I wanted to add. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, I don't see anyone else with their hand up. I, this, this item is, is, is one for noting. Um, I think we've had a good debate and there's some very valid points that have been raised by um, committee members, um, which I'm sure will be uh, factored into deliberations um, as we go forward. Um, but seeing no one else indicating to speak, I'm happy to take this as noted. Um, we don't need a vote on it, do we, Elaine? No, thank you. Um, so we'll move on to item six, which is the economic viability assessment, um, which begins on page 105. And I'll hand over to Simon to take us through that, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, if, if I may, Chairman, just before we do, I don't know whether it's appropriate or the right time, but just to give an update on the retail studies, um, the, the contract. Is that OK? Yep, uh, sure. M mem members previously asked just to be kept informed of where we're at with the, the retail study uh, contract. Uh, the retail study is looking at all the town centres across the district um, to work out uh, convenience and compar comparison goods uh, usage, any leakage and any requirement for any more floor space. Um, the contract has now been let. Um, it's been let to a company uh, called uh, Nexus Planning. Um, we have, we've just started, we've had an inception meeting, um, so it is up and running now, um, and we're working with them closely. Um, there, there, there will be some workshops um, along the way um, with that one as well, and the contract period is due to be three months uh, for completion of that. So it's just a quick update um, on the, as to the, the position with that one. Thank so, you very much, Simon. No Would problem. Anyone... 
like to 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 to, to speak on that bit before we press on with item six. Go for it, Simon. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so, so yes, the next uh, the next uh, paper introduces the economic viability assessment. So the same company have been producing the economic viability assessment as have produced the Schmar, which Kay's just uh, introduced to you, a company called Opinion Research Services. Uh, you will see the name Three Dragons uh, through the report in different places. It's another consultant that they work very closely with. So we've effectively been, been working with the three of them to produce this, this document. The actual original EVA, the last EVA was uh, uh, created in 2015. Uh, so that's actually drifting quite out of date. Uh, it will be seven years out of date, potentially when we submit the review plan uh, next year. So obviously, again, it's important to have a, a, an up-to-date understanding of, of the viability of, of providing affordable housing um, across the district. Um, so it also, it also looks at the viability of sites to provide affordable housing and the contributions that are required as well to things like um, health education. The report is actually split into three main sections, introduction, they then go through the methodology that they've used, and then the actual viability testing. Um, the viability testing is actually used scenario testing of different sites across the district. So they've tested uh, a range of site sizes, um, so hypothetical site sizes of nine dwellings all the way up to a strategic site of a thousand dwellings and then in between different sizes as well. Um, they've looked at different densities as well. Uh, for two reasons, partly the, the density does affect the viability. The more houses you can get onto a site into a smaller area, potentially, you know, the, the more um, the more return you get from that site. Um, but also they've looked at density because the densities vary across the settlements in our district. The towns obviously have the highest level of density and then the, the small villages have a much lower density. And our local plan in the, the, in the settlement proposals DPD does actually set out what we expect in terms of densities in the different levels of settlement. So it's important to understand the, the viability of the providing affordable housing at these different levels of density um, in, 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 in all the different settlements. I mentioned previously that they've actually added in additional costs when they're looking at the viability of a site so biodiversity net gain is almost certainly going to come in um, in the near future. Um, that's something that will add a cost onto the, uh, onto the developer. So that's been factored in. The re requirement for carbon reduction, that could be anything up to 31%. So a carbon reduction in new builds. So again, they've built in a, 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 a figure to, to cover that as well when they're working out the viability. Uh, flood mitigation for the coastal sites and also electric vehicle charging infrastructure as well, something else that, that's, that's uh, going to be a requirement potentially for every development. So those are those are additional costs that they've added in. So in terms of working out the actual viability, they use the residual valuation method, which effectively is adding up all the costs of the development, working out how much the developer is going to sell the entire site for, giving the developer a 20% nominal it's between between 10 and 20 percent nominal profit and then whatever's left over at the bottom is what the land's worth and that's the money that would go to the landowner so obviously when you take the development costs out of it and the developer's profit there has to be something left for the landowner otherwise the landowner isn't going to bother they're not going to be interested in in selling the site or um you know it's, it's, it's better for them to keep it for agricultural use or whatever they're using it for so that's how they've worked out the viability for a site to be viable there has to be enough money left over at the end when you've taken all the development costs out for the landowner to make a profit and for them to sell the land. So that's, that's how they've worked out the viability in, in a nutshell. As part of working out what values to use, we did have some workshops with developers, landowners, um, local agents, um, and they had some one-to-one -one meetings as well. Um, and that was to, to get a, a, an understanding of, of what the, uh, what, what additional um, sort of pressures and constraints there might be in East Lindsay when they're developing a site. So by actually asking the people that are building the houses in East Lindsay effectively, um, are these figures realistic? Because they, they use industry standard figures and, and methodologies to calculate this, but it's important to just make sure there's local context to it. Um, in terms of the overall build costs, uh, East Lindsay were, were on a par with the rest of the country in terms of what it costs to, to actually put the bricks in the ground, to dig the foundations, to put the roof on it, etc. On a par with the rest of the country. 
Um, in terms of actual land values, um, there is a range that they use and following discussions with uh, local landowners, uh, it was clear that the actual land values, as, as, as we know, were, were at the, the lower end of that scale. Um, so they have they have um, pitched it at the at the very sort of lower end of that scale to take that into account. I'll move on now just to the results. Um, I'm not going to go through the entire report. There's, there's lots of different um, rules. Uh, the, the actual overall report only pulls out a certain set of them um, because the, the the entire set of testing results are all in the appendices, and there's a huge volume of different tests that they've done. What they've looked at first is defining the actual value areas. Um, so looking at property sale prices and working out where the highest value is. And they've actually defined three value areas. There's a, a map in the report which shows this in my report. Um, I've, I've extracted that as well, which shows this. Um, and you've got the high value area, an inland area and a coastal area as well. Um, and those areas are, are, are defined by the, the, the values of the properties there. Um, so they're the value areas. So obviously in the, in the high value area, um, you've got Woodall Spa, you can see on the, on the map there, and it also includes Spilsby and Hag Worthingham. The current EVA from 2015, or the previous EVA, I should say now, from 2015, only defined, had, had a high value area, but it was only Woodall Spa that was included in the high value area there. But through the research here, they've, they, they've discovered that house prices, house sale values, are actually high enough in the in the other parts uh, around Hag Worthingham and Spilsby to actually sit within that high value area as well. Um, coast, the, the inland area is effectively everything else inland, which isn't the coast. So that, that covers your inland towns. And then the coastal area um, is, 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 is where, where you're finding the, the, the lower values um, of resale properties, of, of sale prices for properties. So what they've then gone through and done is tested the different scenarios I mentioned before, the different site sizes and densities in all of these different value areas. So the high value area, uh, we can see there that there's actually the potential for up to 50% affordable housing on, on all of the small to medium sized developments. Um, and even the larger developments are still viable, viable with 20 to 25% affordable housing provision. Uh, and that's when you take into account all the development costs that I mentioned before. Um, that also includes the, the, the villages as well, um, which also have um, viability across them um, for, uh, for affordable housing in that area. I just say in terms of villages, they've tested site sizes up to in, in the small villages to up to 75 houses um, on, on a site, um, which obviously in the very small villages you would never expect. But in some of the, the larger villages, you, you do even now see um, larger housing developments happening. Um, when you move on to the inland area, the viability actually drops quite significantly. Um, smaller sites are actually only viable at 25 to 30 percent. Um, but as the size of the site increases, this actually drops away and, and some of the larger sites are very limited or even no viability at all um, on, on them. Um, at the moment, we have a, the, the current local plan has a blanket 30% affordable housing provision across all of the inland areas. In the high value area, it's 50, it's 40%, uh, sorry. Um, and in the, in, the, in the low value area, in the coastal area, um, there's a zero requirement. Um, just looking again at the inland area in terms of viability and um, the villages actually when you move into the inland areas are actually showing no viability um, now um, at the different densities um, apart from the large site of 75 units which does start to benefit from from the economy of scale um, when you move into the coastal zone um, uh, the coastal area sorry um, it's, it's zero zero viability in fact it's actually negative viability across the board apart from one of the scenarios they tested which was a, a site comprising wholly of bungalows, just as a, a test, um, they threw that in there. Um, but obviously the provision of just a site of bungalows in the coastal area brings about other constraints and difficulties that would need to be addressed anyway. Um, what I will say just on the inland, going back to, to larger sites where the viability does decrease on larger sites, you would expect and think that larger sites would benefit from the common economies of scale. And in actual fact, you'd end up having increased viability. The problem is with your larger sites, they bring in much more significant infrastructure costs as well. So rather than just a little estate road in, you might end up having to put in roundabouts, um, largest, larger roads and feeder roads off them. You might need pumping stations, more significant suds works. Um, you know, the, the actual overall infrastructure costs rise quite significantly with your, with your larger sites. 
they have also looked at different types of housing. So specialist housing for older people, uh, that's only shown to be viable in the high value areas. Um, rural exception sites, we have a policy in local plan for rural exception sites, um, but they're only viable with some kind of supporting development um, that it's, sh it's shown. Um, uh, for example, some market housing to support it. Um, and another important thing they looked at and, and discovered was the actual threshold that triggers the need for affordable housing. Now, in our local plan, any development of 15 houses or over triggers the need for an affordable housing contribution. What their analysis has shown is that that could be reduced to 10 houses or more, and it wouldn't affect the viability of, of a site um, or the, 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 the effect would be nominal um, uh, or insignificant. So they have said that, that in, in theory, there is the potential to remove the trigger, uh, to, to lower the trigger, sorry, from 15 to, to 10. Um, and that does fit in um, with what the MPPF says in terms of um, flexibility. Um, it talks about major development um, being the trigger for affordable housing. That's um, effectively it. Um, obviously, you can see from those results that it's not as straightforward as just saying one area is 40%, one area is 30%, one area is 0%. There are a lot of variations even within the three different value areas, depending on the size of the site, depending on the density of the site as well. And obviously viability will also be affected going forwards, depending on what measures come in that, are, that there's still some uncertainty about biodiversity net gain, reduction in carbon, EV charging points, um, you know, and anything to do with those sorts of things that add any kind of cost to the developer. If they come in, they're going to re reduce the viability, but if they don't come in or they come in in a lower value they could actually um potentially improve viability um so again it, it's 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 inevitably as always a a, a statistical uh, analysis based on the evidence we have at the moment um as, as a baseline that's uh, uh, that's all i've got to say on that that chairman at the moment um yeah, obviously i'm happy to answer any questions that people have thank you thank you i um I'll open it up for debate. I've got Councillor Dennis with your hand up. Councillor Dennis, please. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, Simon, it seems, myself as a coastal councillor, that we're moving forward into the future where social housing is desperately needed. We've no provision at all for that on the coast. Which, which seems absolutely crazy to me. I've got one particular street in Skegness that's got 10 um, houses, multiple application in one. It so there's 100 people living in 10 houses and there's no provision at all for social housing where it's most needed. And I understand that, that, that as a policy committee, we're supposed to be looking forward. This doesn't seem, you can throw every statistic at the world at me, but it, that doesn't make any humane sense at all about people who need houses. You know, it just doesn't make, you know, it, absolutely any sense to me at all. I, I, I don't understand it. I, 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 I can see this government must be living in some sort of a, a bubble nationally or something, but surely it's up to us as, 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 as members to, to make provisions for the people that need the help. You know, they don't want to go and live. Where there's, there's, there's plenty of allocation for the all Spar, except nobody wants to use that. But in Skegness and, and Mablethorpe and Sutton, we have a desperate need for social housing. And I, I think somehow the way this whole plan seems to be, is just not correct in any way, short or form, when it comes to people. And I think, we need to have some sort of radical policies in, you, you know, I just think, I don't know how colleagues feel, I just think that we, we seem to be missing the plot here a bit. Thank you. If I'm right in thinking, and I'll let Simon um, answer with, uh, with, with with greater detail than me, this, this paper isn't to say that there that we're not looking to build um, affordable houses in the coast. It's more of where we are, how we are likely to get them. And we cannot, we can't get them delivered um, on the back of uh, market 
housing development, but that isn't the same thing as saying we're not going to build them at all, or we're not going. To, we, we're not acknowledging uh, as the paper we've dealt with um, earlier in today's meeting would support that there is a need there that we, we that we ha that we have to meet. It's just how we go about meeting that, Simon. Yeah, I, I think I think you summed it up in a nutshell there. Um, it's certainly not saying that we've got no intention of, of, of trying to provide affordable housing on the coast um, at all. As you said, right. the, the previous paper that, um, that, that Kay introduced certainly identified a need across the district. But I think an important thing to, to go back to there is, is looking at that, that paper looked at those people that not only want to and aspire to, but can actually realistically afford to actually own an affordable housing figure and a, a, a house through an affordable means and that's why that figure is reduced because with the best one in the world there's a lot of aspiration to be a homeowner but that doesn't mean it's going to be in reach anytime soon for those people what i will say yes i agree this is this was just looking at the, the potential viability off the back of market um it doesn't mean that we wouldn't we, i mean we, we we have supported and we have approved solely affordable housing sites that, that are, are just affordable housing sites um, and often they're working in partnership with a registered provider to provide those. Um, so where there is a subsidy, where there's someone else on board, uh, where we perhaps have a commuted sum from a, from a different type of development um, that could go towards um, financing it, there will always be some opportunity and, that, and that's something that will be supported. This is purely looking at setting out the statistics that we can look at and use when we're, when we're actually writing our policies. So if we were writing a policy for affordable housing and we're looking at the coast, it would be not only pointless, but it would also be dangerous for us to write a policy that said we require 30% affordable housing on every site on the coast. Because what that will do is that will put developers off entirely. They will look at that and go, well, we, can't, we can barely make ends meet on a development on the coast as it is. And your policy is telling us we need to put 30% affordable housing in as well. We're, we're, we're not interested. So it's finding a balance in the policies in the local plan that that do allow affordable housing to, to actually occur and come forwards through various measures, but don't actually stifle the development and put developers off from actually coming to the district and building in, 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 in those areas. Um, I, I take on board um, exactly what you're saying, um, uh, Councillor Dennis, it, it's, it's a very difficult one, but the viability assessment is there to set that baseline so we know it could have come. It could have come out and said, "In actually, on some of these sites, you have got viability for affordable housing," and actually, that 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 then puts us in a quite quite a strong position. But unfortunately, that's that's not the case. Um, but now we know that. Now we understand that the policy that we write can reflect that position, but also then be be written in a way that supports affordable housing separately through provision through other measures. Um, and one such measure the council is pushing forward with at the moment is the council's development company. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I know that's pushing forwards now with sites across the district um, to try and bring them forwards um, and, and in the coastal area as well. Um, so that's an acknowledgement that, that the market does need something else to help it. Um, I think that probably covers it, I hope. Um, and if I come, come back, if I come back, Simon, if I come back, Simon. Yeah, no, I wasn't. No, I don't want to penalise developers. What I'm just saying is somebody needs to build them. I don't mm. much care who does, as long as somebody does. I don't want to penalise the builder. Um, I, 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 I don't know about the new development company. I'm, I'm not in favour of councils being in business, uh, as uh, most of you are aware. But we'll, we'll catch that cold and I'll be probably dead in the ground when you all say, well, it was right in the end. But um, good luck with that one. But uh, I, I think that's totally barking up the wrong tree. They're barking mad. But anyway, that's up to them. That's uh, it, I can say about that. The, 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 our, our, our group of uh, people on the executive seem to know what they're doing, they think. But anyway, that's another, that's another situation. But uh, no, all I'm concerned about is that as long as we get them, you know, I don't want the developers to have that strap around the neck. I, I just know that we as a council have got to look after the people and we've got to look after and people are living in, in conditions that's not correct, not humanely correct, the mind business wise correct. So I, I, please don't think I want developers to bear the brunt of that because I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm very good. I'm in business myself and, and I, I know, you know, you, you've got to be free from that. But I am really concerned that a lot of, a lot of this um, affordable homes, when it comes to I'm on the planning committee and it doesn't get built out and, it, it, and th there needs to be another way of looking at it. We, we need to look after 
these people, you know, they, they deserve, the youth, the kids deserve to have something shiny and nice. And, and, and you know, I know, you know, you have to go to work and get that, but you will eventually get there. But, you know, we've got to do something. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Dennis. No, I mean, I, I, I was about to say something, but the RAF is about to intervene. So I'll go over to Councillor Matthews. Um, just to say, I feel a bit better about this report. It's more current. Um, you've had the consultation with the stakeholder workshops and businesses. And of course, there's an economic argument and it's not going to be viable on the coast. But what I think this report does is give us the ammunition to find ways to actually make sure that we're dealing with the issues around deprivation in our rural and coastal towns um, and find more creative ways of approaching them whether it's through community-led um, companies or whatever, whatever way, um, it certainly, you know, does give the economic argument that there has to be another way to resolve housing in areas with high deprivation and low land prices. So I thought it was a very good report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Matthew. Councillor Howard, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very much um, in the said Dennis camp here. Um, I think we've got um, a report in front of us that basically says we need to build affordable housing. We, we have a need for it along the coast, which I think um, Councillor Dennis points out. It, 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 there are examples where we're crying out for, for this type of housing. And yet we also have a report here that says builders can't afford to build them. Well, if builders can't afford to build them, who the hell can afford to build them? You know, we, we talk about we can bring them in via other means. Well, surely whatever you do in life, you get the person who's best qualified to do the job. So if you want something building, you get a builder. If you want your car repairing, yeah. you get a mechanic. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, we, we need, as uh, Councillor Dennis said, something radical that, you know, really does um, knock the corners off this square and, and turn it into the circle that we require. And, and yet we, we just seem to be putting our hands up and saying, this is the circumstances, and that's it. And that's not good enough. We need to answer these questions, not just acknowledge them. Thank you very much, Councillor Howard. I mean, from my mind, um, I'm very interested in um, the suggestion that the trigger point um, for providing affordable housing um, could be reduced from 15 units down to 10, um, because, it, again, it's the smaller site, the smaller development, which can often be um, higher quality, lower density, and it does feel like we, we, we are currently missing out um, on some capacity there. But well, that is exceedingly noble, Chair. But as Councillor Dennis pointed out, when it gets around a committee, some bright spark with a lot more intelligence than most of us on this committee will argue the point that it, it can't be done and the committee will have to go with that. Then we are back to the, this council beginning to do again what councils used to do to meet this demand and building houses um, off of its own initiative. And the area that I cover was once upon a time the centre of the Sibsia Rural District Council, which was so far insignificant, so small, that it should probably never have been created um, and it was that small and arguably unviable that it was abolished in 1936. But as late as 1927, it was still building units of housing um, in most of the settlements that it covered. Now, maybe the evidence of its failure um, was that as soon as uh, it, it, it was merged into Sibsia Rural District, you had um, rows of houses going up instead of the odd ones or two. But my fundamental point is this, that since councils or since councils left the house building market, then overall numbers of houses of any kind being built have come to, have, have, have reduced significantly. And the, 
the, the, the supply of new affordable social or, um, or, or, or similar houses um, has reduced consummeasurably. And ever since, we have been grasping at, at, at levers um, to try and deliver um, affordable social housing on the back of market development. And there comes a point, and, it, and it, it, I think it's similar to the point that I made um, when we were debating the previous item on, on, on the agenda, that it's one thing having an aspiration, um, it's one thing having a target, but at the end of the day, house builders are not going to build houses. They're certainly not going to build them at a loss, and they're not going to build them at e in East Lindsay if they can make more money building them elsewhere. So I broadly agree with where you're coming from. Um, it's just how we actually get there. Um, sorry, that was my rant in between the RAF. Um, but I, I, I genuinely, I, Councillor Dennis. Yeah, I'm going to have to leave the meeting. I've got somebody turned up, unfortunately. OK, thank you very much, everybody. It's been a, it's been a very interesting debate. Um, I would like to say maybe the Executive Committee of East Lindsay District Council might would like to build some council houses and, and get them built. You know, don't mess about. Margaret Thatcher, who, who people, you mama, I, I know. But she, it was a good thing she, when she sold them. The only bad thing she didn't do was she didn't build any more. And if she'd sold what she'd built, we wouldn't be where we are today. So... I, Let, get, let's get them built. Thank I, you. I, I, I think the one point of agreement between me, you, and um, um, I'm, I'm thinking possibly Councillor Howard and Smith um, is the is, is, is that the, the the mechanism by which councillors were not allowed to invest their um, the money they received from sold council housing stock back into new building was the single biggest failure in what was otherwise um, a good policy. That's 40 right. years too late to put it right, but... Yeah. <laughs> hey, I ain't got another 40 years, mate. I'll tell you, see you later all. Bye. Thank you, Sid. Bye. Bye. Councillor Smith. Yeah, if I could just quickly jump in to, to agree with you, uh, Tom. Um, uh, you know, the... the uh, the, the the I mean yes it was a it was a failure of policy the initial policy of selling off council houses was precisely that that money would would go back into uh, uh, into building and it didn't and it didn't at the uh, at the behest of the building lobby of the of the the, the big building companies um, and the practical implication from this is is that when social housing is built it's built of a low quality whereas can councils built high quality um, social housing and not just social housing just low cost housing for um, all sections of uh, uh, of the community um, and what the failure of councils to build or the uh, difficulties uh, councils have it to build has, has, has led to isn't just a lack of social housing it's also rent e increases making rents impossible for people house price increases um all of which work in the benefit of the uh uh the builders and and to the detriment of uh, of our communities and ultimately of councils and everyone um so uh so yeah i think get straight back onto that um that that building ladder um and i would quite like to see um more interaction with with uh Projects. It's a shame that Dan's not here because uh, the project in 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 Summercoats with the uh, Community Land Trust uh, building their uh, their little cooperative development, I think, is entirely the sort of uh, um, the sort of plan that we need to uh, to be supporting with the with the development company. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Smith. I think it's again. Um, I don't see any, anyone else with their hand up. I was just going to say that this item is again for noting, but it's useful that um, to see how up to date it is, um, and it gives us a it, 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 even if we are um, 
not quite sure um, how we are going to deliver all that we are hopeful that we might, at least it gives us a solid baseline. Um, for doing that. Um, I'm happy to take that as noted. Um, I don't see if anyone else, if everyone is happy for us to do that. If anyone else has any any further points that you please wave at me. Um, but I think that's I think that's a good and useful debate. Um, and it is remarkable how on this committee at least it doesn't seem to matter which points of the political spectrum we come from. Um, we do seem to continue. We, we, we end up at a fairly pragmatic, practical consensus. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, so I will say I will take that as noted. Um, the next item we have is the date of the next meeting. Um, and I see that, that is to be confirmed. I'm assuming that will be confirmed once um dates of everything is sorted out at the next uh at the annual meeting of the council is that right yeah it, thank you chairman yeah i think it's the intention for the program of meetings to be um presented to council on the 27th of april so <clears throat> excuse me some should know by then thank you very much elaine what i would add is appreciating that the the business that we're covering covering at the moment um is essentially the foundation blocks um, on 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 which the plan review will be based. I'm keen, though, that we that there are areas that I know members um, would maybe like us to debate or would like us to look at. Um, I have one or two in the back of my mind, but I'm sure, and I'm sure if I do, so um, do many of you. If there are items that you would like us to put on the agenda, if there are things that you would like us um, to be looking at, at, again, appreciating that we we can't pile too much work onto the planning policy team while they're doing a plan review, because then the plan review will fall over or, and, and will get delayed. But I'm within the boundaries of what's doable. If you have things that you would like us to discuss and debate, um, could you please get in touch with me or with Elaine or with Simon and, and, and raise them. And if we and, and if we possibly can, we'll get them on on on, on agendas or bring papers forward. Um, if that's what, or, or just have a slot on the agenda to have a debate or discussion on certain points, because I've said all the way through, I'm really keen that what we do as planning policy genuinely reflect where members are at. Um, and it's important that, and, and I think it would be useful to include um, a similar shout out on a member's point brief, uh, because again, there are members that are not on this committee, but do have in, an interest and ideas on planning. And I really want what we're doing um, to reflect that and to pick up on ideas and suggestions and, 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 and areas of interest early so that if there is a means of factoring that in, we can do it without getting the plan to such a point that we're presenting it to council and there's loads of stuff that people haven't or feel they haven't had the opportunity to raise. So um, that's just a an, an offer out there, not to go into um, detail today, but if you have thought suggestions, please bring them forward and we will see what we can do. Um, Councillor Smith, is that a legacy hand or is that a new one? No, that that that's that's kind of a new one. Um, if I could just speak to 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 the subject that you were just just discussing, um, I did send an, an email out earlier on, um, just letting people know on the committee that uh, as part of the housing standards scrutiny, um, I was hoping to speak to uh, uh, Councillor Wright from North Kesterburn, um, where. Uh, he, did, he gave a great presentation for the local government association the other day. I don't know how many of us managed to get to that um, on um, the way in which they have raised their housing standards in regards to fuel poverty, insulation, renewable energy, um, all sorts of, of, of great things. 
um, and how they have built that into their local plan and have been uh, working um, in quite a radical fashion to um, to, to use their, their, their local plan as a, as a policy lever for those sorts of uh, improvements in environmental um, standards in their in their homes above and beyond building regs um, and we were hoping to have him come and, and speak to the um, the scrutiny and it just struck me that it might be worth us having some sort of joint session of planning policy and that scrutiny you know if we've got him over we might as well have plan you know the, the guys from planning policy invited along as well just so that we can have a proper uh, kick about of, of all of his ideas and both his experience and the pitfalls that he's come across, you know, so that we're sort of standing on the shoulders of giants. I mean, it might be that, that it's not something we want to take up, but it just seemed like a, a good opportunity for us. Personally, I'd be open to, to, to doing that if, 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 if other members would be, would be. Thank you. Yes. Is that something we can put down as an action, please? I'll um, I'll let you know as soon as we've got something sorted out. Assuming that he agrees to speak to us. <laughs> Thank you. And in a um, similar vein, um, I think it's anticipated that we will um, hear from um, Councillor uh, Bokit, um, who is who, who has. Um, um, who is working her way around planning policy and, and, and across Lincolnshire, looking at um, houses being uh, more accessible and, and building building stuff into um, in, in, into houses at the design stage to make them effectively houses for lifetime use rather than um, up until the point that people begin to struggle. So um, that that's that's on part. I, I, I hopefully, I hopefully, we are sort of on parallel tracks on 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 him the stuff there. Um, Simon, it was only to ask if if it was appropriate and and possible whether um, myself and and Kay and Alex, if they were uh, sort of available and interested and would find it useful, could could also be invited to the uh, scrutiny when when the gentleman comes. Don't know whether that's um, yeah. The, the more the merrier. In my opinion, um, the uh, uh, that day of uh, uh, of workshops that the LGA did was um, by far and away the best day of training and the most informative sets of case studies I think I've ever been to. It was it was really phenomenal. Not just that, but there was there was stuff on retrofitting housing. There was stuff on um, uh, small um, local groups building passive housing, all sorts of great things, some of which went disastrously wrong, but they'd learned the lessons from those and so on. So it was a really, really interesting and good set of, um, uh, of things, you know, um, and stuff I just didn't, e I hadn't even begun to realise that councils were, uh, uh, were getting involved in and being really progressive. It was, it was a really good day. So yeah, all the officers pile in, yeah. Thank you very much. I don't see anyone else waving at me, so I will. I, I think I think there's some really useful and encouraging stuff there, um, and much to look forward to when we um, start the um, start meetings off when we know when they're when they're taking place. So, uh, thanks very much to all of you for your contributions again this afternoon. Um, and I will declare the meeting closed. Uh, wish you all the very